Should I say good morning, everyone? This is Al um, Minister Albert Langston uh, coming to you once again with our uh, weekly Sunday School lessons. Um, I hope you've had a wonderful week, and um, we look forward to being able to serve you all uh, as we normally would um, with the with the Word of God broken down in a way so that everyone can understand it. That's actually the, the whole purpose of Sunday School, is to break it down, to make it uh, uh, easier to understand. Uh, but before we get started uh, with our lesson, let's do, let's offer a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we gather together to be able to worship your word. We'd like to ask that you open our minds and our hearts that we may be able to, to receive the word, to be able to understand the word so that we can apply the word to our everyday lives. We ask that you continue to bless and keep us all. For these and many other blessings in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Yes, uh, uh, family and friends, uh, we are approaching another, we have completed yet another week. Um, I pray that everyone is in very good health. Um, we are studying a topic that I love to talk about, and that's love. Uh, God's love for us. And it's called, the title of today's lesson is Love Divine. Uh, it's located on page 39 in our Sunday School books. Uh, as I say each, each week, if you need a Sunday School book, just give me a call. And I'll make sure that you get one. Uh, my number is area code 901-337-5401. That's 901-337-5401. And we'll, we'll work out a, a method of, of me getting a book to you. Um, pardon me. Um, but as I said, today's lesson is, is entitled Love Divine. Um, what I'm going to do, well, first of all, today's lesson focuses on uh, letters written by Paul while he lived in Ephesus. Uh, you see, the church in Corinth suffered from a bad case of cultural diversity. Corinth is a city uh, on one of the many isthmuses of, of, of Greece. And it was on the trade routes. It was on the, uh, on the um, you know, one of the waterways. And it makes it, uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it made it a popular trade route that was frequented by a plethora of cultures and nationalities. Now, the Church of Corinth, therefore, was composed of different types of people, people of different beliefs, uh, needs, um, and, and origin. And that tends to, when you have a lot of different cultures mixed together, you know, you have an, uh, you, you may have an overlapping of ideas, but you also have ideas and concepts about things that can cause friction. And so that was one of the problems with living and worshiping in Corinth, because even though it was supposed to be one church, 
it still had enough varied ideas in its membership. And if you think about it, uh, this, this also exists in the church today because none of us were brought up completely the same. So therefore, a lot of times we have ideas that have that are kind of divergent. In other words, we we tend to think about the same thing just a little differently. And so therefore, it causes friction sometimes. But, you know, if we just keep our eye on the prize, keep our eye on the master, um, we, we're usually able to get through these types of things. But anyway, this diversity of thought posed a problem for the church because it created a conflict of thoughts and priorities. It was hard for Paul and the church leaders to address the needs of the congregation of membership. Therefore, Paul was called upon to quell some of the differences. Uh, the differences included uh, sub uh, items in, you know, uh, concerning uh, marriage, uh, divorce, worship, uh, bodily resurrection, and actually just living in a pagan society. Paul wrote to encourage the importance of holiness and to correct their understanding of spiritual gifts. In Paul's first letter, he addressed specific issues in the Corinthian church. And he addressed uh, issues of selfishness, division, abuse of gifts, and jealousy. And, uh, but that's just, an, that's just an overview of what we're going to be looking at and, and what we're going to try to, to, to examine. Uh, but if we look on page 39 and we can see the the in focus and our in focus is basically a little story that is set up in our lessons to kind of get us get us into the mindset and into the framework of what uh, the gospel is going to be talking about the the, the writings of uh, uh, from the, 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 the Bible, the verses from the Bible, and um, what our in focus does is it it gives us something really, it, it connects then to now, and it allows us to be able to reflect on some, some of the issues in our church today. So uh, if we look on page 39, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the story to you. This is just in case you don't have a book. If you have a book, great. Uh, please read along with me. Uh, it, it would help you in understanding what the lesson is, is, is all about. And it reads this way. <clears throat> Gail was the president of the church's usher board. She was always on time, impeccably uniformed, and knew all the hand signals. Whenever Gail was on duty, the members had their envelopes and fans before they even requested them. She would immediately move forward when she heard baby, uh, uh, crying babies, firmly removing them from their parents' arms and delivering them to the nursery so that the services could proceed without disruption. As she moved about the sanctuary this morning, Gail was clearly irritated. She had met with the pastor on Saturday afternoon, and he had been critical of her work. The pastor had complimented Gail on her faithfulness and dedication. However, the pastor 
had gone on to tell her that while she clearly enjoyed being an usher, an usher he was concerned that she didn't love the members. Nothing can replace our love for others, he, he said. Working on their behalf is fine, but it is meaningless unless our work is motivated by love. Christian love is essential to make any ministry effective. Now, Gail was so distracted thinking about the pastor's rebuke that she dropped the offering plate during service. It clanged loudly and spilled its contents on the floor. As congregants helped her pick everything up, Gail realized her attitude was keeping the services from proceeding as much as her loud disruption just did. Gail took a calming breath and prayed God would fill her with patience, kindness, and all the attributes of love. When have you had to remind yourself to, to minister with love rather than just fulfill a church obligation? In today's in focus, we see Gail, a church usher, that did her job by the book. She made sure that the members had programs and, and offering envelopes. And she would even uh, relieve and remove crying babies from the sanctuary during the service. However, if these things are not done with love, and sensitivity, that lack of compassion will be sensed by the members of the congregation. And especially if a crying baby is removed. Can you, can you imagine how a parent will misinterpret, will misinterpret what she has done as being offensive? Gail prays to God that he will endow her with all the attributes of love so that her execution of her duties is carried out with spirit that God intends. And, and we, we always have to be aware of that when we serve. We shouldn't be serving just out of a feeling of obligation. We should always serve with the spirit of love. We found that there would be a lot less conflicts because, you know, whether you want to believe it or not, especially if the church is operating properly, we are like family. If you think about it, when, when, when a family member insults you, it hurts a lot more than a stranger off the street. And when we claim that we are a members of the family of the church, members of the family of God, and if our actions don't reflect the love that we should have, then the, our actions are going to be misinterpreted. So love with you, what you do. And show the love. Have, feel, have that feeling of love. Volunteer for things that you love to do. And execute them with a sense of love. Love is all you need. Okay? All right, now, uh, I want to get into the... To, to, uh, our lesson, our the, the, the scriptures and, and what have you for today. Uh, if you turn to page 40, um, excuse me, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, the, uh, 
the church in Corinth was having a few problems. And it's because of the diversity of the people there in Corinth because of its geographical location and and the ability to 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 earn a living the you had a, an overlap of cultures and a mixture of cultures and different types of people and even though the members in the church claim to be worshiping on the same level for the same reasons. Sometimes cultures, uh, opposing cultures or different cultures understand and appreciate or don't appreciate different particular characteristics of what draws them together. Subtle differences. And it even happens in your own church, in your own neighborhood, in your own family. You know, we even think about it when we look at different generations of, of people. My generation uh, 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 of, of, of people I still try to understand well, what happened to the to Generation X, Generation Z, all these different names that they have. The you know baby boomers think about things life a little differently, and it poses a problem. I I have some young nieces and and nephews and and even my own kids. Sometimes I wonder. What do they be thinking? What you know? What's going on in their head? But it's because of changing times. Their cultures are even different from how I grew up. So these types of tensions is are, are, are what Paul is having to address, and. Uh, Let's look over on page 40. Uh, uh, I'm going to read the first three verses. Uh, this, If you have your Bible, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Okay? If you just open your, your Bibles to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. And right now I'm going to read uh, uh, verses 1 to 3, and they read this way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have a gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my gifts to be to feed the poor, and though I give my body to, to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Here, Paul reminds the people of Corinth that prophecy, knowledge, and faith are meaningless without love. I'm going to say it again. Paul reminds the people of Corinth that prophecy, knowledge, and faith are meaningless without love. Even boundless acts of, of charity are not profitable without love. When a person chooses to suffer to the point of martyrdom, that is worthless with, uh, if there is an absence of love. In other words, if you look at how much 
I'm going to just say Oprah Winfrey. I'm just going to just use her as an example. Um, building the schools in Africa. Or for anyone that makes large donations to a charity. But if you're doing it for a tax write-off, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. If you were looking for a blessing, if you were looking to be a blessing, you weren't really looking to be a blessing. You were just looking for a tax write-off. See, that's, 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 to me, that's not even charity because you're looking for something in return. You're not helping yourself in the eyes of God is what I'm saying. There's no lie. There is no real love there. If, you, if you're making a donation or, or giving to someone to, to put on a show, you've lost the purpose of giving. It is more beneficial if you were to give a small amount Willingly, with the true intention of helping someone, than to be rich and then giving a large amount with the ex expectation of getting something in return. See that though that just throws charity right out the window. That's you know that's that's. That's not a divine love. That's still a love for yourself. You're looking for another benefit. There's an ulterior motive there. And it's not the same. It is not the same. Okay, let's, let's look on to... Uh, let's pick up at verse uh, 4. And I'm going to read 4 through 7. And it says, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seek not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Since Paul chooses to associate love with the greatness of all gifts and talents, he poetically describes the attributes of love. He states that love bears, hopes, and endures all things. Love withstands attacks and then continues to endure all things. However, Paul describes love as being an active character trait. I'm going to say that again. Paul describes love as being an active character trait. In other words, it is going to be shown and demonstrated and repeated and you're going to notice that if it is love, it's going to show itself. It is something that one does. It's not just an emotion. In the case of real love, you're going to show it. You're going to, to demonstrate it. it it's, it's not something that you're just going to be holding inside. Love is not an abstract notion. 
but a practice that is actively executed on a daily basis. In other words, you don't just say that love is an idea. Love is going to be, it's not just something that's just in the mind, in other words. It's not abstract. It's, it's not just a thought. Love is going to be shown, and it's going to be shown outwardly. And it is going to be shown on a daily basis. If love is there, it's going to be it's going to be seen. And it's not something that you're going to be turning on and turning off, turning on and turning off. When events are done by the numbers, when ev when events are done by the numbers, merely out of routine. Or is kind of step by step in its execution. Then it is not out of love. Love is not abstract. But it is a practical execution. Of Christian characters. Of emotional connectivity. In other words, it's all going to, to, to mesh together just like this. Love is real and it's active and it's, it's going to it's, it, it's going to show you can't fake love because eventually your little facade is going to come tumbling down. Let's, let's continue. Um, verses, let's put up in verse 8. And reads this way. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. And when that which is perfect is done, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, now I know in part. But then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, love, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. <laughs> love is the greatest of all spiritual gifts. Bottom line. That's because any gift that is not in combination with love becomes a mere duty or a job. I'm going to say it again. Love is the greatest of all spiritual gifts. And that is because any gift that is not in combination with love becomes a mere duty or job. Also, Love is the one thing that will exist after the old has passed away. Paul is using the verse, uh, the verse 13 to address specific issues in the church. 
Verse 13 says, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Paul is saying that selfishness, division, abusive gifts, and envy were abounding. And as cultural integration of pagan beliefs were infiltrating the church itself. Love. Love divine. You know, the Beatles penned a phrase in one of their many hits. You know, y'all yeah, yeah, know, I, I have a tendency to put, remind myself about things you know, when it comes uh, by referencing music. But anyway, the the Beatles penned a phrase in one of their many hits, and they sang, all you need is love. Love is all you need. You know, do this in the church and in your personal relationships should be guided by love. Duties and responsibilities in God's body should be executed as God himself does. And that's with love. When this is done, everything else falls into place. True love comes from God. It is the very nature of God. It is the very nature of who God is. We are often frustrated when doing work for the church because we feel underappreciated or notice the lack of commitment that others may have. Some of us are in a learning mode while others are so familiar they are operating on cruise control. But as I was told somewhere along my road of life, love is an action word. If we love the Lord, we are working in his house, then we're working for him. Your rewards are coming. So, Share your love through your chosen ministries and serve cheerfully. Also, be sure to show love to the ones that are working so diligently because their dedication makes your worship experience a little better. And while I'm thinking about this, uh, I, want you, I, <laughs> I know some folks are going to... Uh, be a little shy, but uh, I want you to contract. I want you to contact Patrice Turnipseed and Denise Norman for helping with these video presentations and the Sunday school lessons as well as the Sunday morning worship. It's love that they're doing for what they're doing, and it's being shared in the church. So show them some love. Show the pastor and some de and the deacons some love. Show each other love. And your worship experience will be a lot better. Heavenly Father, once again, we are sharing love, our love for one another, our love for you, our love for our appointed duties in life. We'd like to ask that you keep us supported, continue to support us as we continue to love one another and to support your church. 
For these and many other blessings in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Divine love. Love one another. Love the church. You all have a great week. Again, if you need a, if you need a Sunday school book, give me a call. We're getting close to the end of this Sunday school book anyway, I think. You all have a blessed week. And love one another. Thank you. Bye.